Welcome to the midweek edition of Legal AF, the top rated legal news analysis podcast in the world with listeners in almost all 50 states. I think we're missing two and 30 countries with your host for this midweek episode, Michael Popak. And our Friedman Agnifilo is here too. All right. Or as listeners like to call us, Popak and KFA. And on today's 40 minute pod, we will explore a fascinating quarter of the law, which we've never touched on in almost 50 episodes of Legal AF, which will interest culture and art lovers all over the world. We're going to talk about the recovery and the return of stolen antiquities, art and artifacts, and the role of prosecutors, including leadership right here with Manhattan, Manhattan's district attorney's office and the antiquities trafficking unit, which became a very muscular organization under Cy Vance. And just last month, for example, the office recovered and returned to Iraqi artifacts seized from billionaire financier Michael Steinhardt, he of the Steinhardt Gallery at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Apparently, he was also, when he wasn't doing that, he was looting Iraqi and other artifacts uh, and antiquities for the last 30 years. And the office, led by those prosecutors, seized over 180 items worth approximately $70 million. And that office now has basically a mini museum of over 3,000 items valued at over a street value of over $200 million um, awaiting their return. They've raided museums and auction houses, art fairs and dealers. I have an interest in stolen art that really started in reading books. Um, there's one in particular uh, uh, called The Book Thieves by Andrews Rydell about the Nazi looting of libraries and the recovery of those books and the return. And there's also been a really great article in The Atlantic with an overview of the Antiquities Trafficking Unit by Ariel Sabar called the Tomb Raiders of the Upper East Side. But who better to talk about this particular unit than one of its supervisors and founders, KFA. KFA, tell us about this unit. and Why, why haven't we heard about it before? So uh, just a slight caveat that, uh, as we all know, and we said before, I can't talk about cases that I supervised, but the unit I can talk about because it has been widely uh, written about and publicized about. And so I just wanted to mention that. Uh, but the Antiquities Trafficking Unit at the Manhattan DA's office was officially created in 2017 by Cy Vance Jr. And, and the new DA, Alvin Bragg, has, uh, has signaled an interest in continuing this important work because as you just said, since he started uh, in January, he's already repatriated several items back to their, their home country, which I think is a good sign that this work is continuing. But this, this unit was created in, in 2017, and it is the only unit of its kind in the world that is led by uh, prosecutors, and it is staffed with a, a chief prosecutor, uh, approximately three lawyers, several analysts who are also experts in art history, and uh, several of their own investigators. And they work in conjunction with, um, with federal and state and international uh, law enforcement truly all over the world. We've, we've worked, uh, the unit has worked with um, the Car Carabinieri, uh, the Carabinieri um, police in Italy and um, with, with other foreign, foreign police forces, but also the FBI, Homeland Security, ICE, and, uh, and, other, um, and other federal agencies, as well as uh, police agencies here in this country. Let's start basically, what is an antiquity? So an antiquity is um, a very old artifact. So think of things uh, from um, a thousand years BC, uh, the types of things that come out of the ground, uh, whether it's coins or tiles or, um, or vases or sculptures, it could be um, parts of temples or pyramids, uh, those types of things, just artifacts, ancient artifacts that are often recovered from the ground, frankly. And, and art, art is included in that? Karen? Yes, it could be ancient art as well. Uh, uh, many of these items are, are ancient art, but an antiquity is something that is very, very old and is um, from, a, from a different time. Okay. Is it a crime to, to traffic yeah. in antiquities? So it's very complicated because the, the question is, is um, it, it all involves uh, it all involves the provenance. OK, so where did it come from and are you allowed to sell it? 
And if you can prove the provenance that, in other words, that that each person was permitted to have it along the way, then it's not a crime. Then it's um, just it's the um, buying and selling of of ancient art and artifacts. I mean, you go to any museum like the Metropolitan Museum of Art and you'll see um, items that date back to thousands of years ago. And those items, most of them, and I'm sure many, I I mean, I, I assume all of them are possessed legally, but every once in a while, there is this there's trafficking of these items that were stolen and that weren't permitted to be sold and bought. And and that's where this unit goes in. And that's why there there needs to be expertise in this unit, because you need to understand the difference between uh, antiquities that are permitted to be um, permitted to be um, bought and sold and items that uh, aren't. And that that's where why these cases are so complicated. But if if these are stolen, then uh, the, the charge here in New York is criminal possession of stolen property. And, and the street value is, is sort of if it's over a million dollars, it's in the first degree, which is a, um, a, a serious felony punishable up to 25 years in in prison. Um, So, you know, the Manhattan, I think Manhattan is uniquely situated to have this kind of unit because, first of all, Manhattan has um, many museums and many art dealers and art galleries. And so it really is a place where where um, it makes sense to have a a prosecution unit that can that can do this uh, type of work. But also because New York law, unlike federal law, for example, has um, a presumption in the law that that uh, allows prosecutors to bring these cases that federal law, that federal authorities can't. So a presumption in the law means that once a prosecutor uh, proves a basic fact, so that a person possessed an item, right? Um, uh, th- you can presume that they knew it was stolen uh, because there's a presumption in the law. It's in, in New York Penal Law Section 165.55 Subdivision 2 that allows uh, for prosecutors um, to argue and, and the judge to instruct the finder of fact, which is mostly uh, most of the time a jury, that a person who's in the business of buying, selling, or dealing dealing in uh, property who possess uh, stolen property, um, the property is presumed to be stolen if uh, they have it without doing a reasonable inquiry that the person from who they obtained it had a lawful right to possess it. And so it's that presumption. It's a rebuttable presumption. And 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 the, and the defense can choose to prove otherwise if they decide to put on a, a defense. But it's a real tool in the toolbox that New York prosecutors have that the Feds don't, um, because it allows a, a lot of the individuals who possess these items will say, "Well, I just didn't know, and um, I had no idea. I was buying it from what I thought was a lawful dealer." I mean, look at the Met, the Metropolitan Museum. Look at Sotheby's. Look at Christie's. You know, the, these are people. Who, these are organizations that are in the business of buying and selling things. But this allow this makes it so the presumption makes it so the, these people who deal in these items they cannot turn a blind eye and claim willful, you know, willful ignorance. So let let me use an example. There was a federal prosecution a number of years ago. And if you were involved in it, you'll tell me you're involved in it. We'll stop talking about it. But Hobby Lobby, were you involved with Hobby Lobby? I was not, but I'm familiar with it. (laughs) So Hobby Lobby brought in and bought the owners of Hobby Lobby, uh, a craft store, liked antiquities, and they bought from Iraqi dealers hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars worth of artifacts and antiquities and had it shipped to them in boxes labeled tile, like they were buying tile. And ultimately, the feds did an investigation, the federal government prosecutors did an investigation. And, you know, they paid a civil fine. And uh, I'm not even sure what happened to the antiquities, but they certainly weren't prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law, which it sounds like they would have been in New York. If that had happened in New York, what do you think would have happened? So so these these cases are complicated. And the reason they're complicated is because they often rely on confidential informants and in order to maintain their secrecy, uh, a lot of these cases are pled out and not given the full 
um, the full force of the law. In fact, uh, in fact, I don't think anyone's gone to prison um, in, in these matters, although there have been people who are prosecuted and convicted. And uh, but as you point out, the Hobby Lobby case, that wasn't even a prosecution. That was a civil matter, a civil forfeiture. And so if that was in New York, that would have most more than likely been, I should say, in New York state. That would have more than likely been a prosecution for sure. I mean, you know, when you do things like you, you, you fake uh, what's in it um, and, and you, you fake the, the label on the box. I mean, that's sort of consciousness of yeah. guilt and, and it, it makes it that that's, that makes it much easier for yeah. a prosecution to prove yeah. that you, that you knew it was fake. Or so the, in, in, in the, to break out a little bit of our legal AF law school, there's a concept in the law as it relates to transactions on the civil side known as the bona fide purchaser or the BFP, the bona fide purchaser, who usually is able to say, well, listen, this might have been stolen, but by the time it got to me, we're back to your provenance description. By the time it got to me, I had no reason to believe it was stolen and therefore against all others, except the rightful owner, at least, I should be able to keep clean title as the BFP or bona fide purchaser. So it sounds like New York has baked into its criminal element on this willful blindness aspect that if you don't make a re- making it affirmative duty to make a reasonable inquiry before you start uh, dealing in antiquities. Right. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. right. And that that gives prosecutors a tool in their toolbox uh, that others don't have. Um, so, you know, the, the, the antiquities unit of the Manhattan DA's office was the passion project of one particular prosecutor uh, in New York named uh, Matthew Bogdanos. And, and Matthew Bogdanos is an interesting character. He is a, I think he's in his early 60s, and he was this uh, this this Greek kid growing up in Queens from in a big family, his parents owned a, owned diners and he worked in the diner and he was really fascinated with the Iliad and the Odyssey. It would read them. Um, and he uh, he went to Columbia Law School uh, or yeah, he went to Columbia Law School and then went on to get his master's uh, as well in um I can't remember in what, but something involving art history or something, something like that. And um, and Matthew uh, joined the Marines and he was a Marine Corps lawyer before joining the Manhattan DA's office. And at the Manhattan DA's office, he came up as a as a regular prosecutor. He uh, he did homicide prosecutions. And, and in fact, he has done some of the most high profile homicide cases that have um that have come out of the Manhattan DA's office. He's a real serious prosecutor, but on the side, he's always had this interest in, in art and antiquities. Well, well, as a Marine, he led the group that um, was investigating the looting of the Iraqi national museum, right? That's, that's sort of where he got a taste for this. So in, that's exactly right. So Mm -hmm. in, after, in 9-11, he was called back uh, after 9-11, he was called up to active duty. And in 2003, um, uh, there was a um, uh, a war in Iraq. I think it was when we invaded Iraq in uh, in in 2003, and it destabilized Baghdad. And the museum there was overrun by looters, and and many 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 items were stolen. And Matthew went to his commander, and he was in the counterintelligence unit. Mm-hmm. Um, and he went to his commanding officer, and he asked for permission to go secure the items. And he took a team, and he went to the the museum. They slept in the library, I believe, if, I, if memory serves. And they set up there, and they um, the, through a series of 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 creating am, giving amnesty to people who would return things. First, they secured the museum from further uh, from further looting and plundering. And then they uh, set up an amnesty program for people to return stolen items, but they also conducted kind of these, these raids uh, where they recovered um, items and they recovered a lot of what was taken from the museum and really helped preserve the, the cultural heritage of Iraq by returning the, this property to them. And he, since then, when he came back to the Manhattan DA's office, he continued the work and, and wanted to create a unit, but wasn't ever given the opportunity until uh, Cy Vance um, 
until Cy Vance had a um, had had money that was seized in a um, money laundering case that could be used, could be repurposed, and he repurposed it by creating creating this unit uh, about five years ago. Yeah, yeah. Ma- Matthew needs a movie made about him. I mean, I'm just looking at his background. I mean, I don't know if his nickname in the Manhattan DA's, DA's office was Pitbull, but apparently in the military, his nickname was Pitbull. He made it to the rank of Colonel. You know, he got he got a bronze star. He was given a National Humanities Medal and honor for all the work he did on recovering Iraqi antiquities. I mean, this, I mean, you were his supervisor. He must have been he must have been interesting to supervise. He's a character. Yeah. He's an absolute character. Yeah. He he you know, he, one of the one of the uh, trials he did, I think one of the only trials he ever lost was the Puff Daddy case, the Sean Combs gun case. And he lost that case. And, you know, he he uh, it, he's tried just all different kinds of cases. He, he was a real interesting guy. He's um, he has a heart of gold. And um, yeah. but his nickname's more the peacock because he walks around and, and preens like a peacock. Um, yeah, well, it's a, it's he's a marine. A, That's a he's, marine. He, I'll tell you, he's a brilliant he's a brilliant <laughs> lawyer. I'm though. sure he's, he's he's the best they have. Well, maybe we'll have we'll one day we'll be able to, you know, he'll get the appropriate permissions and we'll have him on the show with us. Talk, there was one thing that was in the um, the article that The Atlantic put out that I thought was fascinating. And I think it's so old you'll be able to talk about it. But I think it brings the point home of how aggressive this prosecutor's office is. Um, they talk about a sting operation for coin recovery that led to a raid at the Waldorf Astoria. Uh, and I think you were definitely involved with that from the way I read the article. Can, we, can you talk about that? Sure, I can talk about what was publicly reported. For yeah, sure. let's do let's do that. Um, so so that was an interesting uh, that was an interesting case. So that was before the unit was actually created. Um, Matthew was doing these cases still. And um, and in 2011, right when uh when Cy Vance was uh, was elected about, I think, a year before that he started. So still new to the office. In 2011, Matthew uh, came to um, came to us and said that the New York International Numismatic Convention was taking place at the Waldorf Astoria in New York. Now, at the time, I didn't know what a numismatic convention was about, but it's a, a coins. It's it's a coin collection. And um, and there's this whole numismatic society and coin collectors from all over the world. And they were coming to New York and uh, to have this um to have this convention. And there we got information that there was going to be stolen coins that were uh, being traded or sold. And in Italy, there is a law um, that states that any coin or item uh, removed from the ground after 1909 is illegal. So if anyone who has been to um, Italy, there's there are ruins um, and there are there are um, archaeological digs that occur all the time. But those that property belongs to the country of Italy. Um, anything that that came out of the ground after 1909. So if you possess something from Italy, your provenance has to show that it was uh, came out of the ground before 1909. Um, so to prove that it's not um not uh, illegal. And there are items, there are coins, for example, that that are that are known to exist that you can trade that the provenance has been identified and are legally possessed and traded in. But these coins were new to the market and did not appear in any of the coin um, documentation of of existing coins. And there was evidence that these were quote unquote fresh coins or recently dug up. Uh, And there was no paperwork um, to to show uh, any provenance that was that was legal. And uh, an individual, a a very prominent hand surgeon from, I believe, Rhode Island named Peter Weiss or Arnold Peter Weiss was um, was going to sell sell these coins. And they did a sting operation. He was arrested. 
These were these were fifth century BC uh, coins worth um, approximately three hundred thousand dollars, and he ended up pleading guilty to three misdemeanors. And he did some community service. He paid a fine, and he wrote an article actually uh, for the Numismatic Society talking about the trade of illegal coins to help um, inform people so that other people wouldn't do this um, and couldn't couldn't do this, but in a strange twist. So one of the things um, that we were very concerned about at the time was, are you sure this is real? Because, you know, these ind- people who trade in antiquities are are not your your average defendant. I mean, these are these are philanthropists. These are, you know, doctors. These are surgeons. These are, you know, wealthy people um, who who trade in 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 who, who go in sort of the highest um, society circles. And so, and so um, there was concern, are you sure? And we were sure. Um, and these coins, it, they turned out to be fake, but it was not easy to, term, to determine that they were fake. Uh, they had to, we had to have them evaluated by some electron, I can't remember what it was called, but some super special microscope uh, that, that doesn't exist um, you know, it had to it had to go to a, a specialist, and it was it was it was called an electron electromagnetic microscope, or something. I can't remember what it was called, but some special it was, microscope. It was, to, it was to date them. It was to and and yes, it was exactly right, and it was only through that that we realized they turned out to to be fakes, but they were such good fakes that it really concerned us because the fact that there could be a market that there's such a market for these items that there's this other black market that creates these incredible fake coins uh, that even experts like um, like Dr. Weiss thought they were real and and was was going to sell them for over three hundred thousand dollars. That should just tell you uh, what kind of a black market there is out there for for antiquities and for these fake antiquities. He ended up pleading to attempted uh, attempted. Um, possession of stolen property because he thought, right. Because he thought because it was he, real. He thought it was real. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So that was, that was a really interesting, a really yeah. interesting case to be. How about, uh, how about the, uh, and we'll put up a picture of it on our pod today. How about this um, Kim Kardashian posing in front of a, uh, a mummy coffin at the, at the Met that, that your office eventually determined uh, was a stolen antiquity. Can you talk about so, that? Sure. So again, I'll talk about what, was publicly reported. Um, so in, in 2011, there was an 18 day uh, revolution in, um, in Egypt. And uh, during that revolution, there was a solid gold uh, sarcophagus uh, that was stolen. It traded hands um, several times. It went to the uh, United Arab Emirates, then it went to a, a German dealer. And each time it was sort of washed with fake documentations along the way to, to try to um, to try to make it so that it, it was um, the provenance was being sort of washed and given the imprimatur of legitimacy by being traded in these legitimate circles. Um, the contents had a, uh, an Egyptian priest in it, but the looters were in, with, in such haste removed the contents um, that they actually left behind a finger um, of, uh, of this Egyptian priest, the bone um, inside. Now, the, um, the Met acquired this golden coffin. Uh, it was from the first century BC and paid $4 million from it. Now, there were some red flags that the Met should have been aware of. Um, there was these conflicting ownership papers that um, that were available. Uh, and there was also um, involvement in known illegal traffickers. Um, the finger was missing. The finger was in there. There was also <laughs> um, also one of the, the 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 export license from Egypt turned out to be forged. And the telltale sign was it said on there the Arab Republic of Egypt before the country and it was dated before the country ever used that name. So any person, you know, you would think that the the Met, this is, again, sort of the turning the blind eye, the willful ignorance. I mean, the Met has they employ experts who, who know these types of things. And before they're going to pay four million dollars for something. Um, they could very easily figure out that that this was that this was stolen. They were, but they were so blown away by the artifact 
this solid gold sarcophagus, which Kim, exactly. Kar- which Kim Kardashian apparently matched her dress to when she took well, the photo. So that, that was in tw- right. that was in 2018 when she right, took so the photo. Still, right, still sitting. So it's pr- it's prominently displayed. So so how did your office get back? Believe it or not. Kim Kardashian posing in front of it is what helped solve the case. <laughs> so so, so good. she's she's posing in front of it. It's widely, widely publicized that the Met has it. Um, and then that's how we figured out uh, that that it was there, that it was stolen. And um, the Manhattan DA's office uh, ended up seizing it from the Met. And they, they, you know, look, I will say they are a very cooperative entity. And as soon as they find out that something is um, stolen, they, they, um, they absolutely, there's no hesitation in returning it to its rightful owner. Let's break, let's break it down before we leave tonight's podcast. Uh, Let's walk through when you say they seized it. I go to the Met. I live a few blocks away. I can't walk in and just see something that I like. So how did how do you get a seizure order? Who gives it to you? And then from there, what do you do with it? Is it still sitting in the mini museum at the Manhattan DA's office? Where is the sarcophagus today? Let's start with seizure. How do you how do you how does the office get a seizure? So I'm not so okay. I'm going to talk generally, not in, about this oh, case in particular. Oh, I'll make you. So, I'll make you a blanket promise. You never have to talk about on this podcast anything that you worked on. Just talk in generalities. In general, thank you. So uh, in general, uh, what happens is you get a search warrant, and um, in a search warrant, uh, you, what you have to do is you have an affiant or somebody who's going to swear in front of a judge and affirm that uh, that there's probable cause to believe that there is a particular item in a particular place that um, constitute either evidence of a crime or, um, or, or proceeds of a crime. And, um, and you have to be very specific. You have to describe what the location is. You have to describe the facts and the details of, of how you have probable cause to believe that this exists and, um, and that it's criminal. And you, you put this in a document known as a search warrant and you go before a judge and the judge, you know, you swear in front of the judge and the judge um, reads it. And if they find that there's probable cause and that it meets all the other legal requirements, they will sign the search warrant and you present that search warrant. I mean, you know, there's different kinds of search warrants. There's the dramatic no knock search warrant when you think something will be destroyed, like drugs, you know, knocking on the door and the drug you know, people have take, have drugs and they're flushing it down the toilet. You, you were know, worried that, about the vet flushing the coffin down the toilet. Correct. Correct. So so typically um, in that situation, um, you just have to let them know that that it exists and, and they will happily, I, you know, places like the Met and, and other very reputable places, frankly, if you just go to them and tell them um, that it's stolen and show them why I'm I'm. I'm confident that they would uh, actually turn it over, but, but it's still done, you know, you know, by a subpoena or some other means, but it's still done um, typically uh, with a search warrant. And, and then um, what happens is it has to be stored somewhere. And at the Manhattan DA's office, uh, they have, they're, they're clearly, um, in the business of storing um, of storing evidence, I mean that's been done, done all the time. Everything from drugs and guns to Trump's tax returns. You know, when they finally obtained those, they had to be stored. What you know, room so, are those so, in? Oh, sorry. So the, the Manhattan <laughs> DA's office knows how to store valuable things. So so this was no different. Um, but there is a, a particular designated a, a couple of different areas, both on site and um, off site, uh, and you know they are packed. They're bubble wrapped. You know, look, some of these some of the items are these these, you know, vases, these really delicate vases that have to be bubble wrapped and packed and secured. Um, other items are, are, you know, parts of temples that were sawed off and you can still see the saw marks and the grass marks on the ground, you know, from them, from is, from when is they it were insured? on the ground. Does, does the office insure these works? So that there's all, all kinds of, of yes, there's all there's all kinds okay. of, of of complicated um, uh, uh, complicated things that go into the storage of these items, but they do try to repatriate them to their uh, rightful countries. And but what's the um, process in the middle? So you've seized it by way of search warrant. Some some dealers or legitimate museums like the Met will say, okay, I see the paperwork, keep it. 
But I'm sure there's competing stakeholders that'll be like, no, we're going to fight for the return of this. Or a country steps forward and says, or you've identified a country as being where you're going to send it back. It doesn't go just search warrant back to the rightful owner, right? Isn't there a Correct. court process in between? Yes. Okay. So there's a court, uh, there's a court process in between. So um, if there is a prosecution, then that's one court process. If there's no prosecution, there are sometimes when we recover items, but there's no particular person that you can say uh, is responsible or would have known. And so the, or if there is um, a confidential informant that we, that the prosecution doesn't want to reveal their sources. And so it's not worth prosecuting the person for, and they just want to return it. Many of the, um, many of the, uh, the individuals who would claim ownership um, don't want to call attention to themselves. Um, and so m many of them will give the, will, will agree to relinquish their items and not fight for the ownership of the items. Um, and, but sometimes it has to go before a judge and the judge will have to determine uh, the ownership. And then that, that would be determined um, any way that stolen property is determined. You know, that's a process that goes on in any stolen property case where two different people claim ownership. And so that just happens through court process and a hearing and ownership and, and the ownership will be determined. And ultimately, once it's determined to go to um, go to back to its owner and the owner is a foreign country, it gets repatriated through a repatriation ceremony. And, uh, and I actually, um, there were a few times when, when DA Vance was um, out of the jurisdiction and I was the acting district attorney. And during those times, there were some repatriation ceremonies because the Manhattan DA's office has repatriated over, over 1500 items uh, that they've, that they've returned um, to, to the countries. um that that they were stolen from a lot of and ceremonies, you know, well, sometimes there's multiple, multiple <laughs> items at one ceremony. Um, but but the ceremonies are, are quite moving, actually. They, they're they these official ceremonies that happen uh, usually at the at the embassy um, of that country. And sometimes but sometimes at the DA's office and, and foreign dignitaries come and there's usually a, like a hand an official signing of the documents and handing them over. And it's a formal ceremony. And and the the countries receiving these items that were stolen from them. I mean, this is when you think about it, these are precious works of art from their history. It really is their cultural history. And it's really moving what it means to them to receive the, these items back. But, you know, sometimes countries aren't ready for their items uh, to, to receive them because perhaps they're still in the midst of some kind of destabilized um a destabilized kind of uh, situation. And, and those are the items um, that sometimes take a little bit longer to return. Uh, but there's, you know, right now they, they have um, about a thousand or around a thousand items um, that are not in the process yet of, they, they're still in that process of, that you were just asking about um, figuring out who the owner is to, to return them. Well, what a fascinating aspect of your career. And I'm so glad we had an opportunity to share it with our listeners and followers. Um, that's a wrap for this week. We're not we're not going to talk about mummies and sarcophaguses again. But uh, what a what a light that we're shining on a corner of law that you know most podcasts aren't addressing. And and who better to do it with than my co-anchor KFA? Uh, the audio for this pod will be dropping tonight on all platforms in which you can get your podcast from from Apple to Google to uh, uh, even Spotify. And join my anchor and co-anchor, Ben Micellis, this weekend when we do our regular edition of Legal AF, where we cover 10 or 11 hard-hitting topics at the intersection of law and politics. We do that live with a recording at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on um, uh, YouTube for Midas Touch and also for uh, Facebook for Midas Touch. And then we drop the audio midnight uh, uh, early Sunday morning for that particular podcast. So um, any any final words, Karen, before we sign off? Yeah, the only final thing I will say is, um, is in the 10 years since the unit was created, Sotheby's has closed their New York auction of ancient art. Uh, they closed that in 2017 and moved it to London. It used to be in New York. Uh, they say it reflects, they did it because it reflects the demand from collectors. I found it interesting. 
yeah, it, it sounds like you guys did a good job of getting an auction house to relocate. But uh, this was a, this was my pleasure again, signing off Michael Popak and Karen Friedman Agnifilo for the midweek edition of Legal AF. Shout out to the Midas Mighty and the Legal AFers.